My dogs are just going to chill in the back. Perfect. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's installment of Glucon Weekly, sponsored by SignalWire. Today, we have with us Tim Penton, who is a co-founder and CTO at Pipe GmbH, which is an IoT and security uh, company. And we also have our lead platform engineer, Michael Juris, from SignalWire. And we're here to talk about IoT, security, Weber to see, and a few other things. So first of all, welcome, and thank you very much for joining us. Tim, if you'd like to introduce yourself just for a second, that would be great. Yeah, I'm, I'm Tim Panton. Um, I've been doing, I stumbled into VoIP, as it, as it says in my bio, 20 years ago, and I've been trying to avoid it ever since, and somehow, like, it hasn't worked out that way. I, I still do voice calls, um, you know, and, and still build little servers and stuff like that. 20 years later and i i don't really understand why but it seems to have got a hold on me <laughs> we've all been trying to leave but it keeps sucking us in right <laughs> right cool so the first thing that uh, to ask you about is your newer startup well newer is four years since and counting going on uh iot based pipe what it is that you do and uh just in general what is uh the focus of the activities you've been doing so like the, the marketing thing is that we, we provide a WebRTC stack for small cameras. So if you want to build a, like a, one of these things and you want to put it out in the market, this but you want people to be able to access it from a browser um, and securely and remotely, then you can put our little WebRTC stack in there, which we wrote. Like it's not LibWebRTC. It's not anybody else's stack. We wrote oh. like almost all of it ourselves. Um, and it runs on small ARM devices. And so it's like targeted at that platform. And, the, and the, the reason that we've done it not living using LibWebRTC is that like LibWebRTC has got a whole ton of assumptions about like that it lives in a browser and it does a ton of stuff that we don't just don't need. And that, you know, it's huge. And so to try to run it on a small device like this is a, is a you can get there, but it's a lot of work. Uh, whereas we've started from scratch and we've designed like a, a, a stack that will fit in that space and that works a little differently because it knows it's not in the browser. And so it in effect acts as a proxy for things that live on the device. So if you've got like a, a camera with a, a video stream coming from it, we act as a proxy for that. Like you do your stuff as a manufacturer, you do your stuff with the camera, you do whatever AI stuff you want to do. It does, you know, thief recognition or whatever it's going to do. And then you feed that video stream into the pipe agent and the pipe agent will turn it into a good web OTC citizen. But you can also do other stuff on there. Like if you've got a little web server or something like that, we can also proxy that up into the cloud in up into your device and not going through the cloud. It looks like it's on the cloud, but actually we're using peer-to-peer -peer technology that's part of WebRTC. So I, you ask yourself, well, why are we doing that? And you, you just have to look at the headlines for like, all of the security and in, incidents that have happened for like small cameras recently. I, I saw one the other day, is it ADT? Um, they had somebody who was, uh, they had somebody in their head office who was viewing the video streams of the pretty women. Oh, wow. Right, of the installed cameras. Right. And this is, an, I, because it's not encrypted end to end uh, and they centralized all the authentication, that's a problem. Right? So, what we're interested in is pushing out all of the auth and, and all of the crypto keys out to the edge so that the user and the, crypt and the device have their crypto keys. But we in the center, as device manufacturers or as software providers have never had those keys, never seen them, never used them, can't get at them. And that's okay. the kind of, so we're a classic end-to-end -end, uh, thing, kind of, you know, the shorthand I'm using these days is we're trying to do what Signal did for messaging, only for IoT devices. Did any of that make sense? No, a lot of that makes sense, actually. So uh, I think I was going to ask you about WebRTC and IoT, but it looks like you're doing a lot of WebRTC right now. Uh, do you think like, do you think WebRTC as a place in IoT, I suppose, it does? It's uh, often told as a browser-based technology, but looks like it's not anymore. Well, so one end is the browser, typically, not, although not always, right? Um, but, you know, like what we've done is we've made the other end possible to run on small devices as, as WebRTC. And that's kind of, um, 
that's actually quite valuable, I think. There are video is the obvious one. Video and audio are the obvious ones. But where you've got something else that needs low latency, that's also interesting. Because, like, you know, the whole WebRTC thesis is to try and drive the latency down so that you can get a good communication like, you know, like this. But if you can then carry signal over that that is maybe um, driving a motor or uh, switching a light on and off, you can get much faster feedback out of that out of that loop. And so it's not just in the in the video space that it plays. And I, I've got a little demo which we'll play with later, um, which kind of drives that point home, I think. Oh, I'd be very happy about it. So earlier we were discussing one thing, uh, the fact that these devices reside on various types of networks and people have been at home for a long time. And do you think that uh, using home networks has been has had an impact in the industry? And is there anything we could do or not do to make things better since everybody's going to be working out of home for a long time? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's kind of weird, this. I, I'm in in a... In a old guy position, you almost unique old guy position of having, um, I, I was in a pub in like 90, I guess, 96, probably. And somebody said to me, hey, you know, you should apply for a bunch of IP addresses. And I'm like, well, why would I want them? And they said, well, look, they're giving them away for free. You can have 256, just apply for them and you'll get them. And I'm like, well, all right. So I got I have a class C and I've had this class C and it's been rooted to my house for the last 15 years. So I'm in the unique position of being able to stand up little servers anytime I like, and, and they will appear on the internet as fully fledged citizens. And, you know, I can get a, a let's encrypt certificate for it and whatever. Um, and I kind of started building things around those ideas and, you know, you can put a raspberry Pi on the rack behind me and I, it'll appear on the internet if I want it to. But then I found our customers couldn't do that, right? I can't, can't ship one of these cameras to somebody and say, hey, you know, there you go, the web server's visible. Because it isn't. It's behind that. Like the person who bolts this external camera to the wall and puts it on their Wi-Fi then has to try and expose it to the outside world in a way that's secure and, and usable. And that makes that really, really difficult. And what we're finding in, in lockdown is the same thing is true for our... our all of the other things that we're doing. Um, so it's kind of, you know, I think for me, maybe the realization was different because I was in a different position, but but that is really gets in the way of a lot of things until you start using technology like WebRTC mm -hmm. to drill through it, which is what Mike and I were talking about earlier, that like the media, we've always been able to run the media directly between the two ends. Um, you know, that you, I mean, when did, when did we first start doing that with SIP? With, I mean, with SIP, we're talking 20 years we're, with it actually being ubiquitous in devices. I mean, iBeam, X-Lite, whatever, had stun kind of support back 10 plus years now. So it, the, the tools have been out there. The, the part that I find interesting, because, I mean, we all know that the tools now allow us to punch through not just for voice and video, but for other sorts of streams. The same approaches, the stun ice approaches work. You can do it with data channel, all that. How much of an impediment is that little locator service on the internet that allows two devices to connect directly? How much of an impediment is that to um, people having services they host locally? Is it, like, Is that a big deal these days or is it a big deal on the more theoretical, true point-to-point -point signal um, kind of concept, but we're like totally without any central service that could theoretically mess with it. Is, is that the big deal or is it like, is it an actual usability issue or is it a more conceptual security issue? Once you bring someone else in, they could be a bad actor. So I think it's a bit of both. Like there's just the pragmatic stuff of like trying to stand up something that will run HTTPS, right? Yeah. Is, is a, and that's like a natural starting point. Everyone would expect to kind of be able to, maybe only for casual use, they expect to be able to browse to it. And you'll find that like more and more uh, native apps are getting grumpy about 
doing non-HTTPS traffic. So it's not just the web browser, but the native apps as well on, on smartphones are starting to get like they don't really want to go to something that's that's uh, that's not secure. You'll get a kind of a flag up for that. And so, yeah, I think at that level, just the kind of introductory, how do I get it started point? Yeah, it's an obstacle. Um, and then yeah, you say theoretical security, but wherever the keys lie, that's who yeah. you have to trust. And, and you know, um, so uh, I think it's security is getting, well, I think it's getting more interesting, but hey, I've always, I'm biased, so, you know. <laughs> I, I mean, what's your thoughts on DTLS, SRTP, and if, if that's enough to secure the end-to-end, -end, um, is that good enough? I, I mean, obviously, there there is risk in the initial exchanges, in the um, the path that they that those traverse. But is DTLS SRTP enough to solve that? I mean, I know that was part of the ZRTP push of hmm. never having th that be the weak point. But it you know it has other complications. Right. So. Um... I mean, I guess there's two things to say there, one of which is I think what we're all using for DTLS SRTP 128-bit um, is probably not enough. And so we're, we're going to, you know, 128-bit RSA is going to outdate fairly soon. And so we're going to have to upgrade that. And, you know, that's a some crypto engineers are going to have a, a few weeks hard work, but it's actually like it's already in Chrome and we just have to put it into our servers. And I, I don't know if you guys already have, maybe you have, I haven't yet, but it'll happen. Um, and is, then the other question, I guess, is what you were saying about like the initial handshake. And we have, this is one of the things that we've done in pipe and we actually filed a filed and got granted a patent on um, is how to do that initial handshake in a way that, avoids doing um, avoids the possibility of the man in the middle. You don't have to trust. So you do need a rendezvous point. You do need a point in the middle to, like, to do the, the exchange of signaling messages, set up messages, whatever you want to think of them as. But you don't have to trust it. Because of the way that we built Pipe um, specifically for IoT devices, you don't have to trust that intermediary. Um, you can tell if they're lying, basically. Um, and you can, and the fun, really fun thing is you can do that in a browser. We don't have to have like a native app to do that. Um, and so that's actually, that's turned out to be really, um, really fun to, to, to be able to like have a, an end to end session where the keys are at each end and the distribution mechanism does that in a way that isn't, um, isn't interceptable by the middle. Um, and that's not a kind of, that sounds like a th super theoretical and difficult thing to do, but it turns out it's as easy as scanning a QR code. So, I, is, that, is that a combo of data channel and the rendezvous point for signaling to verify, or um, a basic mechanism without getting into? So, so yeah, I mean, we end up we end up doing basically what you do is you have some way of passing the you need a way of passing the fingerprint. The, um, the DTLS fingerprint for the, the self certificate as a, on a back channel. And if you pass that over a QR code and you verify that it can only have gone over that QR code, then, um, then you know that that path has been established without um, being changed in the middle. So you can, you can use the fact that you know what the fingerprint is to start a, a, a call and, right. and validate that who you're talking to is who you intend to talk to, and and the the, the back channel being this visual thing. So basically, what you the the thesis is that if you physically, if you're the person who's picked up this camera, plugged it in, switched it on for the first time, then and 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 you know maybe it shows a QR code on the back, or you show it a QR code, whichever. Mm -hmm. um, then. Like you're physically asserting that you own it at that point, and you can. It doesn't have to be visual. We, you know, we've got customers who use um, Bluetooth LE or or other, like low range, long, short range um, radio, whatever. It doesn't matter. But provided you can do that 
out of band exchange to verify that 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 uh, that fingerprint, then you're you're good to go. And then you can like bootstrap that off. And once you've got ownership, you can lend it to other people and like all of this. It doesn't scale to a kind of massive PKI, but it does let you manage, you know, domestic devices or, or devices in a small business. And so that's the kind of um, technical basis for Pipe. But we want to kind of, oh, and I guess the other thing is like, it runs on really small devices. Like this is a Raspberry Pi Zero uh, and it runs very nicely on there. So like we're not, you know, we're going on for that level of device. Um, that's where we want to try and make sure that people can um, can do this. So yeah, it does look like we've seen we've seen more WebRTC based hardware in the market. It's uh, it's something that's been coming up. I guess that's part of the acceptance of a, of a new technology. To know. It's relatively new to us, but WebRTC is pretty new for people, really. It's uh, it's been so. You mentioned you two mentioned something very interesting earlier, and that's off a tangent. But I'm curious, what happened to ZRTP? Looks like <laughs> it went away. I never figured why it wasn't more widely adopted. Honestly, because the key they never figured out how to do the key exchange in a way that was usable. Yeah, like I I actually I don't know if you remember this, Mike, but I had a stand up row with with Phil Zimmerman in at Flucon. About how, about how the 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 idea that people would read hex digits to each other as a way of securing something wasn't going to be make it um, you know a successful user user experience and like surely we could do better and uh, and the answer was well yeah I mean I think the long answer is that it it effectively that sort of technology morphed into what is now Signal. And 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 is morphing further into MLS, but yeah, as you say, that's slightly off the beaten track of 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 you know. Um, yeah, I was what? really just curious because for a while I remember doing a lot on ZRTP, thinking about it, implementing those doing weird doing those weird key exchanges. Probably we've done something together, Michael, probably on that like Frizzwitch stuff and. The, the interesting th thing is, I think Signal, I mean, Signal is the same sort of approach. You verify a fingerprint. I think they execute it better, but then I'll ask a question, how many people have actually verified out of band any signature on Signal? Yeah, that's, um, a, that's I, an interesting... The, the real solution requires, I mean, you, even even your approach you were talking about, I think is, I don't know the crypto, but is potentially subject to an initial man in the middle if they catch it the first thing and they replace the video stream of the QR code and, and, and play man in the middle. It, I, it, potential without a fingerprint verification, it, it would be complicated because you're doing data and video and all these things. But I think crypto, it's potentially possible if so we we've we've looked at this and we had academics look at it as well and and provided you can't actually get in and scan the QR code so what we what we typical way that we do it the way to think about it is that you have a QR code that appears when you first switch on a device yeah and provided nobody else can scan that QR code before you do then we're good. So yeah, in theory, there could be somebody else with a camera in the room who, mm -hmm. who scanned it first, but you would notice because you didn't get control of the device. So what we've, like our thesis with this is that if you can't, if we make the device unusable until you've done this scan, then you kind of, and if it remains unusable, then hey, you probably push the hardware reset and start again, and then you kick the, your attacker out. So it's like, the idea is that because it's the, basically it's the first in first thing you do with the device, you're kind of inevitably will do it. Whereas mm. I think all of this kind of verifying after the fact is becomes optional and therefore it doesn't get done. Yeah, and it, and it could almost be done with a clever thing where you hold the camera up to your screen and scan a QR code back. Right. Uh, there, there's, I don't yeah. understand why it hasn't been made. Well, I do actually. Like I have this thesis, which is, which is a lot of people, particularly in the industry we're in, actually enjoy complexity. Yeah, but yeah, it's what Signal has almost done well. If 
if Signal offered, like, if, if I had an easy way when I was with my friend on Signal, mm-hmm. where some Bluetooth LE thing where it verified fingerprints and stuff like that, that would almost make it perfect, other than COVID and you don't see your friends anymore. Right, right. All of these proximity things are like blown away by yeah. COVID. I mean, right. it, it's so frustrating for me. It's like, you know, and actually that, that was kind of interesting because I spent a few months at the beginning of the year like doing, um, writing little small services that just use WebRTC and that weren't really pipe based because like the proximity thing was just kind of getting in my head and I kind of thought, well, we'll, look, we'll forget the proximity, we'll do something else. So I just wrote a bunch of kind of very narrowly focused WebRTC based services. Um, in that space and you know looking at kind of i wrote a thing for recording podcasts and um and uh, i've got one for like sms triggered video calls so if you want to have a video call with a uncle who doesn't really do you know yeah. um, do voip you send them an sms with a link in it and that's enough to start a video call that's great so before we take a look at your demo, which I think will be very interesting to the audience, I do have one last question. You briefly mentioned end-to-end encryption, and end-to-end encryption has been a little bit of a talk of the industry for a while. Like It comes up from time to time. Some people seem to be enamored with it. Some other people uh, maybe realize it's not the end-all, be-all of security. So I'd like to ask your opinion, your you both of you opinion about what end-to-end encryption really means for the web or this industry right now. Is it that important? Can it be done? Does it take away too much? Um, so I have a slightly contrarian view on end-to-end, which is I think that in, a lo- in most cases, what it really provides is it provides plausible deniability for the service provider. <laughs> right. It allows the service providers to say, no, I wasn't listening to your board call. Yeah, I, I don't know. I didn't know that you were about to float this stock. Um, and I couldn't have known it because the math says I couldn't. And, and actually, I think that's its main value. Hmm. I see. Yeah, I, I, end-to-end, it, it, in the end, that's the value of end-to-end. Plus, I mean, theoretically, actual security. But as we were talking about, DTLS, SRGP is kind of the, the current levels are not quite sufficient for you know, real hardened security. Um, but I, I, think I, that, I, I say that it's like lightly, but yeah, those those attacks do happen. Like, I mean, I was saying, um, like this this thing with with ADT when having staff, yeah, and and it's not just them. Like everybody's had this of staff intercepting video or intercepting recordings inappropriately. Um, you know, whilst it's technically possible, that's going to happen. And if you make it technically really, 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 really difficult, and so difficult that you'll attract the attention of either, you know, the three-letter agencies or the police if you start doing it, then people don't do it, right? So it's actually, you know, the your the protection is for those companies who are uh, at risk from reputational risk or or actually being sued because of the, you know, malpractice of their employees. So, so it's, a, it's, it's an interesting topic, particularly as we're recording this call on an MCU-based device, um, which by its nature has decoded video on the server. Um, there, there are advantages to a more SFU type approach, which could allow for end-to-end security and an MCU approach. There's a bunch of server-side things we can do that are way more difficult uh, to do uh, w- with an end-to-end security model. For example, recording. If you want to record the full stream in a reliable way with end-to-end security, that becomes really complex. Um, my uh, assertion has always been there are there's values to each approach and they serve different needs. But if you need real security without potential men in the middle, the approach that we take doesn't work. It requires either an end-to-end encryption approach or a hybrid approach that communicates whether you know one of those ends is a, is is the entity recording. You know, and, and the endpoints would have to know that. Um, 
I, I, I think I, there's value in both is, is the interesting part in, 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 in a mix of them. But for sure. And I think it also like what le is often left out of this is what the contractual relationship is. Like I'm, I'm much more trusting of somebody of, a, of an entity with which I have a contractual relationship because somewhere in the document, it says what they're allowed to do and what they're not. And I can sue them if they like, if, if my data leaks, whereas if I'm using a free service that I just happened on the, you know, happened on and I'm not paying for it and I have no contractual relationship with them or I'm paying them, I bought, this thing and and like I have no service contract, then like I've got almost no recall, um, got no way of getting getting that back, and therefore kind of people get lazier as well. I think it, it's an interesting comment. I was just involved in a conversation about Signal um, and verifiability. Um, Signal's great, and it's probably end to end secure, and we have source code out there that is auditable, but if we're downloading the app, we don't really know that the source code is really, you know, that is published is really what was there. Um, and, and there's not real solid ways. I mean, they're going to publish a fingerprint and say, no, really, this is a source code, but there's a trust thing there. Um, and there are cloud services, which was our conversation earlier about, you know, what's the impediment of people doing pure end to end is they need some sort of relay point and can it be manipulated in between? Um, we only trust that it isn't in signal because we've audited the code, but we're not really running. How many people build their own signal? Mm, yeah, not many. <laughs> yes. Um, similarly, even in WebRTC, there's the same sort of trust, even if you've audited the WebRTC code, even if you've audited the Chrome code. Um, in the end, you trust that the binary you're getting is based off of that. Um, yeah. And also, it's too big to actually audit. At least signals, you know, a reasonable size. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I think you're like you're veering towards sort of absolutist security, and and, and that doesn't happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm pointing out that absolute security isn't a thing. Right. But, but I think... Going, but then it's the chip, you know? It, it's a question <laughs> of, like, of making it hard enough that your casual employee doesn't do it. Um, and, and that's, you know, when we're not there. Certainly in the IoT world, we're nowhere near there. And I don't believe we are with, with, with some of the kind of free video services either. I think some of them have have, you know... Have had um, incidents that that shouldn't have happened and that have been reputationally damaging. Um, and in my mind, not sufficiently reputationally damaging. But hey, you know that's kind of me being um, vicious. Maybe. So, in your position of trying to enable device manufacturers to deliver a product that's actually secure, mm. um, and I know security is important to you, device man manufacturers have notoriously not cared about this. How have you found engaging device managers in a way to actually care? Yeah, it, 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 it's tricky. Um, like what we quite often find is that like you can engage at one level and then another piece of the organization won't buy it. Um, or, or, or you can even get them to sign off on, hey, this is a thing we want to do. But then the developers say, but it's not in AWS, and therefore, like, this is going to damage our careers. Um, like, I've heard that before, and it's just so infuriating. But like, so yeah, no, I mean, it's a genuine problem, and and the trick is to go for markets where, where the customers mind. Um, so you know, security cameras, kind of, it's in the name, um, and so people sort of, in theory, feel they should care about it. But actually, the place where people really care is baby monitors. Like the idea that a hacker can monitor your 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 children really does get up people's noses, and they they do they're prepared to pay a bit extra for it, which is what's important. Um, so that's that's that I think is the is the best kind of viewpoint. But the thing is, if we do this right, we can make it easier than than the the, the current messing around with installing an RTSP client and all this stuff, like, because it's in your browser. It should be, you know, it should be easy. Um, 
So maybe that's a good moment to like to 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 run this foolish demo. Yeah, that's um, uh, yeah, that's a great. Uh, that's what I'm, something. What I'm going to do is put this into the chat, and then mm -hmm. I think what will be most amusing is if you guys then open it and one of you shares it. So it'll be a it'll just open it in Chrome and then share it into the into the uh, session. Um, I. It's better if you do that because I'm probably going to start running out of bandwidth when we do this. So, uh, sure. so that's in the chat, and that's a, a Chrome URL. And I, uh, the audio is going to get confusing because you're going to get audio from two sources now. But um, I figure it should still uh, still play. All righty. So let's try sharing screen. Uh, <laughs> I have to accept this. Um, a second, I apparently have not turned this on on this computer. So um, I figure at least sounds right. So you're in. Now all you need to do is let the viewers see it. There we go. Let's and see. Okay, yeah. this working. All right. Nice. So uh, you want to accept that? Yeah, let me. Oh, okay. Uh, That's not what it did, but anyway. Not what it did. So. Um, oh, we'll have it. We we can edit those ten seconds out. Right. Um. Let's. Now let's, we've lost it. Uh, let me try. In Chrome tab. This is uh, use a device. I shared the wrong thing. There we go. Yay. And yeah. okay. So I'm going to click accept. Okay. Now, this is a video camera pointing at the floor in my living room. Um, oh. And, and yeah, we, we're going to get a bit of echo out of this probably. But, so the idea is that you can use your cursor keys to move us around, to move your droid around and play football with it. Really? Yes, so really. If I join, uh, do I get a different droid? Yes. Oh man. <laughs> so I mean, the audio sounds of oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be a little bit of echo. <laughs> that's that's uh, that's awesome. And is this all running through pipe? So this is all running WebRTC over the data channel and um, audio. So the audio is a mess because um, it's like we're in a two conferences at once. The idea here is, and maybe I'll explain it a bit. We'll drive around for a while and I'll explain in a second. <laughs> this is amazing. I'm the one on the lower left. Cool. So how does this work? I'm very interested. So I'm going to quit out. Uh, maybe whoever's got the audio running, I maybe I'll... Yeah, if I quit out of it, that'll probably do the trick. Um, right, do I lose echo now? There we go. I got a lot of echo there, so it's kind of hard to talk. But so I'm now not driving, but you guys continue, can continue. Um, so um, what the uh, what that's doing is there's a video camera that's sitting on a Raspberry Pi um, just pointing at the floor. And the Raspberry Pi is running our WebRTC code. Um, and what you've done is is got a video stream off it, but you've also got a, um, a data channel. And each of the data channels drives one of the droids. And so um, you, you, you're establishing a data channel to the droid. And the droid is actually running a its own little web server. So there are like four WebRTC-capable uh, Raspberry Pis sitting on the floor. And there's one behind the camera that you're looking at. So. Um, yeah, and then uh, amongst all that, we also run a, a video, com an audio conference, so that people can talk amongst themselves. And the idea was like basically, I set this up. A friend of mine has a um, kid has a birthday party tomorrow, and he was like, he, "We're in lockdown in the UK, and you can't do uh, parties." So the idea was that at least him and three friends can can hang out together and and play virtual football um, That's and a have a laugh. Idea. Yeah, so, that, that's an amazing idea, actually. Thank you very much. It was very, very interesting. So, so there is there is a practical use of WebRTC 
on um, IoT devices. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Great. So I think we're approaching the end of the segment for today. And uh, thank you, Tim. And thank you, Mike, for joining us. In particular, thank you for to Tim Penton, co-founder of Pipe and this wonderful IoT devices. And I think I'll keep I'll stay in and just keep playing after because it's so much fun. You're welcome. <laughs> and thank you so much. And uh, please tune in to for the next episode. But uh, thanks again for to everybody for joining. And we'll see you next time. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Thank you.